Hey everyone, I am standing on the north bank of the Rappahannock River in Stafford County, Virginia. You may be able to see behind me the city of Fredericksburg, and we are commemorating here with the American Battlefield Trust the 160th anniversary of the Fredericksburg campaign. Now, how do we get to Fredericksburg? Why Fredericksburg? It's a rather innocuous colonial city that dates back to the time of George Washington, but here in 1862, two armies are going to converge. Ambrose Burnside's Army of the Potomac and Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And to talk more about why Fredericksburg is so important to both sides, I'm going to bring on my colleague Sarah Byerly. Sarah, come on and take it away. Thanks, Dan. Um, we want to kind of do a little bit of an overview. What's happening, and as Dan said, how the armies get here. So when we're looking at the Eastern Theater in the autumn of 1862, the Battle of Antietam, Battle of Sharpsburg has happened on September 17th, 1862. And while this does force the Confederate Army to retreat from their invasion of Maryland, there is not a crushing defeat of the Confederate Army. Robert E. Lee is able to slip away across the Potomac River and and President Lincoln really wants George B. McClellan, commander of the Union Army, to follow up on the success, fight again, defeat the Confederates again, ideally. But McClellan is inclined to not do that. Um, he's going to sit for a while, um, something that McClellan is often criticized for. And this is going to lead to Lincoln looking for a replacement general. And the replacement general that he's going to choose is a man named Ambrose Burnside. And McClellan's going to find out on November 5th that he's going to be relieved of command. Burnside takes command of the Army of the Potomac on November 7th. Now this is very unpopular with the soldiers in the Army of the Potomac. They love McClellan. He's the, the general that built the Army of the Potomac. He led them on the peninsula. He led them at Antietam. He's extremely popular. So they have some doubts about Burnside. And Ambrose Burnside himself has doubts about, well, himself. Um, he's not sure that he's cut out for army command, but he decides he'd rather have command than it go to the other option. And the other option was General Joseph Hooker, who is spoiler alert for next year. Hooker will get a chance at command with the Army of the Potomac, but not in the autumn of 1862. Now, Burnside needs to come up with a new strategy. Lincoln is looking for a victory. And one of the reasons Lincoln needs a victory is he's announced that preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And a military victory from federal forces is going to give weight to that promise of freedom that he is making. So Lincoln is pressuring generals in the Western Theater and also in the East for a victory before the end of the year. And Burnside is going to come up with an idea and he wants to use the railroad. And that is part of the reason that he's going to shift his army toward the Fredericksburg area. Dan, do you want to join us and talk a little bit more about the railroad? And then we can talk about the Confederates. Yeah, coming absolutely. In? And uh, I think to sum up what Sarah just mentioned, the two things that drive this campaign is, is the is politics with the upcoming Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln needs a victory to give that proclamation teeth and logistics. Burnside has to get to Richmond before the end of the year. How does he do that? He has to move roughly about 120,000 men south from his position roughly around the area of Warrington about 30 miles off to the northwest to get to Richmond. How does he supply his army on the way south? He's sitting astride the Origin Alexandria Railroad at the time, but it's an older line. It runs away from his objective of Richmond. So he looks a little bit farther to the east and he sees the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. And you might, if you're watching this video and some of our other videos, you might be able to hear the railroad off in the distance as trains are still using the rail line that runs through Fredericksburg today. The Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac is a newer line and it has the capacity to support his 120,000 man army. So Burnside decides that he's going to move to Fredericksburg, but he's going to need pontoons, which you can see over to our right or recreation of these pontoons to get across the Rappahannock, which is off to my right and just below me at the base of Stafford Heights. Burnside begins moving his army out of Warrenton toward Fredericksburg around the middle of November, and he actually steals a march on Robert E. Lee, and he's able to reach the heights here at Fredericksburg or overlooking the city before Lee really has 
time to react. But the pontoons are delayed and Burnside is going to be stuck on the north bank of the Rappahannock as the Confederates begin to filter in from the Shenandoah Valley, Culpeper County off to our west to take up a position west of Fredericksburg to block Burnside's route to the south. And for that march, I'm going to bring Sarah back onto the camera. Thanks, Dan. Yes, so Robert E. Lee um, has to make a decision on how he's going to get his troops to Fredericksburg. And he initially considers a different location. He's thinking about setting up defensive lines along the North Anna River, which, as some of you may know, is quite a ways south of where we are at Fredericksburg now. And he is convinced um, by Jefferson Davis and then by unfolding circumstances that perhaps it would be better to come up to the Fredericksburg area, set up defensive lines here. So the first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia is commanded by General James Longstreet, and they are the first to arrive here in the Fredericksburg area. They're going to take up a defensive position along the high ground, as Dan talked about, west of town, areas known as Marie's Heights um, and the high ground out in that area. The second corps of the Army of Northern Virginia is commanded by Thomas Jonathan Jackson, who's probably better known by his nickname Stonewall. Now Jackson is out in the Shenandoah Valley to the west. That's a long ways to march, but Jackson actually gets his army moving on the road toward Fredericksburg before he receives orders from Lee. So an interesting um, guess that he makes that turns out well for the Confederates. He's going to march south in the Shenandoah Valley. He'll cross Massanutten Mountain at Newmarket Gap. Um, a lot of his troops will go through Thornton Gap as they're heading east, come through Culpeper and that area. And then when they arrive in the Fredericksburg area toward the end of November, Lee is going to have Jackson's Corps stretch along the Rappahannock River. Um, so they're, they're in the Down River area for about 18 to 20 miles down to the Port Royal area because Lee does not know what Burnside's objective is at this point. He just knows that the Army of the Potomac is sitting on Stafford Heights and who knows what they're planning next. So because Lee doesn't know where Burnside might plan to cross, he stretches his army out, and that does play into the situation as it unfolds on December 11th and 13th, which I'm sure we'll be talking about in some of the other videos. Now, I do want to point out, because a question that I sometimes hear is, why the pontoon bridges? Are there no bridges here at Fredericksburg? Well, that's kind of a, a yes and a no um, answer to the question. So there were bridges that go from the Stafford side of the river to the Fredericksburg side of the river um, in the pre-war years and even during the beginning of the war. But in the spring of 1862, Union troops come to the Fredericksburg area for the first time and in an attempt to keep them from crossing the river, Confederates have burned those bridges. And those bridges have not been repaired. And that's the reason that these pontoon bridges, these floating portable bridges uh, that Burnside is bringing with him are going to be so important. And to talk about some of the fiascos with the arrival of, of the pontoon bridges and to help answer the question as to why, why not just cross up river, Dan Davis. Thank you, Sarah. Burnside, again, has been blocked by Lee here at Fredericksburg, and we're getting into the, the latter part of November, early December of 1862. How does Burnside get across the Rappahannock and get to his uh, get to Richmond effectively? So Burnside looks upstream, looks off to the north. There's a slack water navigation canal to the north, making things very difficult in that sector for his uh, to get his army across. He looks downstream toward Port Royal, but the problem at Port Royal is that the river widens in that area. It's blocked by Jackson's Corps, as Sarah mentioned. So after weighing these two options, upstream and downstream, Burnside decides that he is going to cross into the city itself. He knows that Lee's army is somewhat divided. There's a gap off to the south of the city, and he hopes to get across the river as quickly as he possibly can before the Confederates can react, push through the city, seize the heights beyond the town, and then take the Telegraph Road or modern Route 1, and that will be his avenue of approach, his route directly into Richmond. But unfortunately for Burnside, Events are not going to unfold that way. And what's going to happen beginning, as Sarah mentioned, December 11th through the 13th is going to become a major disaster for the Union Army here at Fredericksburg.